Hi. <laughs> Should I try again? Awesome. Right, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to talk to you guys. I've been in St. Andrews for a while. I was an undergrad here. I did my master's, I did my PhD. It's been really good 11 years. <laughs> I'd love to be a lecturer, but I'm a teaching fellow, but we're hoping to get there. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and I really love what I do. I really, really love what I do, because it lets me be two really cool things, yeah? It lets me be an academic, but it also lets me be a political activist. And through doing anthropology, I ended up going to Amazonia and working with a group of people that call themselves Ashaninka, or Ashaninka Sanori, which means the real people. They look like that, but they also look like that. I mean, let's not essentialize these guys. These guys are no angels. These guys are no primitive savages. These guys are no tree huggers. These guys are no kind of, I mean, they are as bad and as good as we all are, yeah? But what's so interesting about them is that they have a very different way of approaching society, of understanding the world, etc. And I want to talk about that a bit today. The other thing about them that it's notable is that they live on top of the third largest natural gas reserve in the world. They live surrounded by um, oil wells. There's a lot of gold in the rivers. They live in forests of very expensive timber. So their everyday life is a struggle to live in the way they want to live, yeah? Uh, as an anthropologist, I also got a very different view into my country. That arrow is generally pointing into the area where I did my field work, very close to Brazil. But I also, and, and this is the part that I really like, as a, as a young teacher, I get to interact with people like you guys that challenge me to think differently about the things I take for granted about my own work. What I want to do today is try to make you rethink what you take for granted, yeah? And I think that anthropology can really, the anthropological approach has something that can work for different disciplines, but that can also be applied to our everyday life, yeah? And it's that. Don't mistake your own lack of imagination for the deficiencies in the worldviews of other people. What do I mean by this? Just because we cannot understand what other people do, or, or we cannot you know, conceive of it as being real, doesn't mean that it doesn't work for them, or doesn't mean that it's wrong, yeah? Anthropology calls this ethnocentrism. If you've been to lectures, you know what it was. <laughs> so, uh, in summary, it's this idea that <coughs> our group is the best, our practices are the best, and then we evaluate the practices of other groups uh, through that, yeah? What... I'm losing myself. Right. Something else that, that I learned through anthropology is that even though we may all live in the, in the same planet, we all live on Earth, we live in multiple worlds within, within the Earth, yeah? We all have different worldviews. Each of these worldviews has a different understanding of what it means to be a human being, which are often clashing, yeah? I don't know, I'm not talking about biology here. I'm not talking about what it means to be a, a, a human being from a biological perspective. I'm not talking about biological similarities. I'm talking about ontological differences, yeah? So, as expected, these different ways of being a human on Earth also create different ways of understanding what well-being is and of achieving that kind of well-being, yeah? So, why should we take indigenous worldviews seriously? Well, I mean, the easy answer is because they're human beings too, and they have the right to live in the way they want to live, yeah? But there's also many practical good things that we can get from trying to understand the way they live, the way they relate to the environment. And I want to tell you a little bit about how Ashaninka people do this, yeah? Ashaninka people approach the Earth as a social agent, yeah? I'm not proposing that we start seeing things in, the, in, the, in, in exactly the same way that they do, that we, that we change our completely our way of understanding what it means to be a human being, because that's impossible, yeah? That's just not going to happen. But what I'm proposing is that we have to stop being so arrogant, and we have to kind of like open our eyes and ears to what indigenous people have to offer for you know, ways of solving the problems that we're going to face in the next, well, 600 years, probably in less than that, when it comes to the, uh, the Earth and the environment, yeah? So, what, what I find is that it, it's, it's very clear that you're American or Western or whatever you want to call it, 
mainstream thinking and society is trapped in a narrative that it's uh, based on a model of humanity that many analysts in sustainable development, anthropology, etc., believe that is leading us to the end of the world, yeah, to a literal, literal end of the world. world. So, um, again, indigenous people are proposing a different model of humanity that I think may help us understand Earth in a different way and kind of like try to resolve some of the problems that are going to come up. And what I want to talk about today is, is, is about the possibility of considering the way they understand nature as part of a truly, um, as part of, of a store of, a, a collective store of ways to deal with the problems that are going to come up in the future, yeah? So, we, as in, in, in our societies, we make a distinction between nature on one side and culture and society on the other, yeah? For Ashaniki people and many other groups, this distinction does not stand. It, it's all part of the same thing, yeah? So nature, the environment, and natural resources are not outside social interaction. They interact with them as they interact with any other social agent, yeah? So the Earth is not a, a set of commodities. It is not a distant, extractable commodities, but it's a social agent, yeah? This is not a metaphor. This is, this is a natural relation, yeah? Um, so they interact as with nature, as they will with other social agents, which leads to a different interve intervention of nature. Now, this, is, this can be scientifically proven by the fact that um, studies have shown that the areas with greatest biodiversity in the world are also the areas that have the highest levels of, of linguistic and cultural diversity, which are areas in which different indigenous groups live here. Yeah? So, for example, Ashaninka people believe that, and this is the area where I did my field work, that the current scarcity of game and fish that they're experiencing and the current, what they say is a lack of productivity of the land, is linked to the earth being angry, yeah? So the earth, is actually, the earth has emotions, has human emotions. And why is the earth angry? The earth is angry because of what happened in the last 20 years in their territory. Firstly, it was the, the Peruvian internal war, uh, the Shining Path versus the Peruvian state, some of you may know about it. And Ashantika people took part in that. They had a very bloody experience. It was, it was terrible, yeah? The other reason why they say the Earth is angry is because there's so much extraction going on in the area. Natural gas, oil, timber, gold, etc. So from an Ashantika perspective, reconciliation in the wake of the war is not just restarting social relations amongst people, <laughs> but it's also restarting social relations with environment, yeah? With, with the territory, with the social agents living within their territory, yeah? David Cameron recently asked that question. Do good lives have to cost the earth? States and our societies propose that well-being is an individual undertaking. It is our responsibility. We, ha we have to reach it. We have to find a way to reach it. But in doing so, they seem to propose that we have to become citizen consumers. Yeah? Yet, how is our individual well-being linked to that of our communities? How is our individual well-being linked to the well-being of the earth? How can we achieve well-being without it costing us the Earth? Well, again, from an anthropological perspective and from many other disciplines, I guess, we know that um, individuals do not exist outside social relations, so therefore well-being and humanity are both relational. From an Ashantika perspective, well-being is definitely relational because you cannot achieve the well-being of human beings without achieving the well-being of the Earth. So they are related, they're, they're one and the other, yeah? they're all part of the same thing. I, all these ideas that we, we talk about kind of like in, in SD, in anthropology, about progress, development, modernization, globalization, social evolution, they all seem to kind of like point out at a future in which we, we take for granted that all these different worldviews in, 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 on, on Earth are going to homogenize themselves through some evolutionary process in which, at the end, we're all going uh, to end up with this kind of like rational scientific approach, yeah? The destruction of all these unique ways of understanding humanity, of understanding the world, is, I think, is a crime against humanity, yeah? It's, it's ethnocide. But at the same time, it's also making us lose all these different ways of being, of understanding nature, all these different ways through which, all these different tools with which to face what's going to happen in the future, yeah? 
all these issues that we're going to have to consider as a planet, as, as a global community in the future. And I just leave you with that. I mean, let's think of where we're heading uh, following our, our models, the models that we're putting forth right now. And let's think of where we want to go from that. And let's just kind of like, you know, open our ears, open our eyes, and listen to what indigenous people have to say. Thank you.